You look at me, I'm about to tell you.
Yes, yes, yes. Da 
and right there to, to punctuate when you're wrong, pull you up when you're wrong, and escort you when you are right. So today, on behalf of my parents who are not here, and um, a lot of my friends who didn't make it here today, and uh, I am here with a group of us, you might see us around, um, the Peace Liberators. We are a social group founded in New York by a founded member of Peace Liberators. And what we try to do is um, we try to give back to St. Vincent because the Lord has blessed us to be in a position. We're not rich, but He blessed us to be in a position that we could give back because we feel that if you live this life and you cannot give back and contribute to make this world a better place than you meet it, then you have failed in all your obligations, no matter what your worldly achievement is, because one of the things I know is that whatever you achieve worldly, you're not going to take it with you. You got to leave it here. So we believe that we should give back while we are here. So today, we take the opportunity we take the opportunity to bring some medical supplies. Some of you saw, it, saw us riding around with it because I drive it past standing on the house and back to the hospital. We take the opportunity to deliver a lot of medical supplies, walkers, wheelchairs, bedding, adult pampers, trucks, and masks and what and crutches and stuff like that to the Union Island Hospital in honor of Tantino. We did that today. I, I, I think I think it's a fitting it's a fitting thing for me to do on this day that we are here to give up our final rest of Amen. So I thank all of you on behalf of these liberators, myself, Don Howard, and some of the Howard family who are too shy to talk. <laughs> all right, thank you.
is my biological aunt. She was the second of eight children from Edna Howard. She was the only girl. And at a very early age, the normal took the responsibility of taking care of the whole family. At a very tender age, she took care of her last brother, Cyril, who, at that time, a mother and one of her sons had to go to Trinidad for medical services, thanking her to take care of Cyril as a mother. Later on, she takes her Cyril wife and his children, all of them in That is the nature of that woman. She was a friend to everyone. Never an enemy, always a close friend to everyone. Norma had no enemies whatsoever, regardless of what they did to her. I remember one incident where a young man accused Norma, Norma Thomas of stealing from his house and went to the police. Police came to her house to arrest her. When she finished with the police, they were sorry for themselves. She gave them a good lecture. And after that, she went and looked for Stoey, who reported that she stole things from his house. And she gave him a good tongue lashing. I thought she would have been an enemy for life for Stoey. But on my return visit one time to Union Island, I met Story and my aunt in the room in the, in the yard speaking. I said, how come you, his friend with this man, he said, oh, don't worry. Him. I forgive him long time. I have no enemy. Thank you, Norma, for that person. She was a great cook, and she fed everyone in Union Island who passed by us. I think she reminds me of the miracle with the body and the five fishes on the body that she described before. Because regardless of what, when you pass by that house, you got food. And I often wonder how she make it because sometimes I pass with a friend and she'll give me a meal. And a meal that was satisfying. And the pot didn't look any better. So I was wondering how come she was feeding so many people, you know, and that went on for years. Her favorite food was pea soup. And when she cooked a pea soup, everybody knew that I don't want to try to know pea soup. So she taught me to make that pea soup. And I told her in the last days, I will make pea soup for you. And she said, okay, I'm waiting for it. On Independence Day last year, I sensed my aunt was not feeling well. Because you see, every night before she go to bed, she will get a call from me for the last five years since my father died. Because my father did that. And he mandated that I do that until she died. So I had, I had no choice. So I came to Union Island and when I got there, she said, I'm okay, you know, don't worry about them. But she didn't look into me. But she went in the kitchen. And although Benaya and Bernadine told her, Granny, go back up and stay. And we went to give Granny this food. She said, don't worry about them, they know what to do. And she went to the kitchen and made sure that I had food. How No problem, I will end up. So, I must end off because I was mandated to do so. On the 23rd of December, I called the hospital. Anis asked me, Anis, I told Anis I want to speak to my aunt. She said, well, she ain't talking at all. So, she gave, I, talk, I said, I want to talk to her. You put the phone at her age. It was 8 o'clock in the evening, now I normally call. And she said to me, I said to her, Tanti Norma, how are you doing? I'm bringing the food piece of down, and I'm coming out to see you. I said, I love you, as we usually see at the end of our conversation. And she said to me, I love you. 
And I think those were the last words of the of the home. So we should remember to always love somebody. Amen. Thank you, Mama. Amen. Rest in peace. And may God be with you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> My name is Pastor Rello Ferrari. I'm Norma's nephew. I'm honored to take this opportunity on behalf of the Ferraris, the Galways, and the Batiste families to pay tribute to the life Auntie Norma has lived. You see, life is the sum of your choices. That quote came from Albert Camus, a Nobel Prize winning novelist, who by these remarks vividly brought to life the story of a woman that I was very fond of, Tanti Norman. As was called by many, you didn't have to be blood related to her to feel comfortable calling her Auntie Norma. And she loved and embraced everyone. You see, she operated by a very high, by very high Christian morals and values. And these Christian morals and values impacted in a significant way how she lived her life. She was not afraid to share those morals and values with all with whom she came into contact. She was a very positive person, very optimistic. You would not find her involved in quarrels and disputes. As an adult, she impacted my siblings and I she was always a source of encouragement to us. When she did not see or hear from us, from my siblings who live here, she would go to their homes and visit them or call them to find out how they were doing. And she would take the opportunity to give them a lesson about the importance of staying in touch with family. She took personal interest in the details of our lives. She knew about each of us and our children. She constantly told us she loved us and blessed us each time she got an opportunity. She counseled my brother while she was in the hospital. My brother Renrick, she says to Renrick, when I want you to take care of yourself, don't worry about anything. Drink plenty of water. <laughs> she taught us to acknowledge God at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. You see, observing her challenged me as an adult to be a better husband. Observing her challenged me to be a better father. You see, I will never forget her positive words of encouragement, instructions, and affirmation. We will be more intentional in emulating her positive character traits and try to be impactful as she was. I want to say we are happy that we can celebrate the long life that God has given to her. May she rest in peace. Amen. Good afternoon to everyone. It isn't easy to lose a loved one, especially someone who is very, very nice, as Tanti Norma. She is small in stature, but she was a giant of a woman. She was caring. She offered advice. She was never one to mince words, but she would tell you quietly when you are right and when you are wrong. 
When Tandy Norm was at the hospital, I went to visit her. And when she saw me coming, her announcement was, well, I'm telling you now, I won't be here anymore. So I tried to stop her and said, no, I'm, you'll be here. You have to cut the ribbon again. She said, you hear what I'm telling you? I can feel it in my body. So I said, oh, no, man, we'll be celebrating your next birthday. And she stopped me again. She said, you think I committed on bone stone? <laughs> Such grace and contentment in a woman. Tante Norma came to me. To me, she was like my grandmother. You know, everywhere in life, somewhere you go, you go to different places, and you ask yourself, well, what it is, what would I need? But God always prepares someone for you who would look after you, take care of you. And to me, she was that person. Sometimes I'll get a message, Tanti Norma looking for you. Another person will come and say, Tanti Norma calling you. And when I visit her, she always have the advice as a grandmother would give to any grandchildren. And she would say, listen, they're waiting for you at such and such place. Don't go. When you meet them in the road, smile and say hello. <laughs> you know how many encounters Tante Norma would have thwarted because she got the news, she called me specially, and she gave me that advice. Sometimes I will drop in unexpectedly, and especially if it is around lunchtime and she's busy in the kitchen, when she see me, she say, well, somebody share cut. <laughs> and Kay will say, but mommy, how you can do that? And she say, Kay, you always get. <laughs> Mr. Olivier only drop in once in a while. So it's his turn. And Kay would have to be satisfied with that. She's a person, she was so caring, so giving. Nothing was too much for her to share or to give. And not only to me, but also to, I also know to a number of persons who she took care of. She would say, man, it's too far for you to walk, to, to go home, to come back to school. You can have your lunch here. And you can do this here. I remember all the days sitting by Tante Norma. We have this special place in the porch where we will sit and she will give me advice. And she would admonish me as if I were her son. That is why I'm telling you today, she came to me, to me. I refer to her as my grandmother. My grandmother who left and gone, Tante Norma took her place. And I would just like to thank the family members for sharing her not only with me, but the other persons around here whose life she would have impacted. This small woman in stature who gave so much to a community, who gave so much to people regardless of who you are, once she is able to, once she has that communication with you, she is able to make sure that whatever she did in her life would have a very positive influence on, on you. And I wish to thank you again, all family members, for this woman who is lying here today, who gave so much in this small community to make sure that the lives of the people was much better than who they are. She was a woman, as I said, she, it, nothing is too, too much for she to say. Nothing was too much for she to give. Nothing was too much for she to console and give advice to whoever it is. She's in a better place. And I know that maybe at mornings and at nights, I would have been on her prayer list. And I thank her very much for the impact she had on my life and what she has done for me and so many other people. May her soul rest in peace. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for coming there.
Um, my name is Amanda Thomas Johnson. I'm a grandson of uh, Mr. Norma Thomas. Um, Norma Violet Thomas was born at the Kingstown General Hospital, St. Vincent, on the 24th of April, 1924, to Ednis Matthias and Andrew Ferrari. At nine months old, she was brought to live on Union Island with her grandparents, Jonas Ferrari, a shipwright, and Adelaide Ferrari. She grew up in Jerome, the village that lies on the edge of Ashton, just before he reached Clifton. The Ferraris were a large family with 10 children, including Tanti Ruth, who is here today. Mary, Norma's dear sister, also grew up in that household. Ruth was just three years old when Norma arrived from St. Vincent and recalled being delighted to have a new baby in the house. They grew up like sisters, helping and supporting one another. Who could have expected that their relationship would be flourishing more than 90 years later? Typically, Norma's day consisted of waking up early in the morning to tend the family's goats, sheep and cattle, then going to school, where her favourite subjects were maths and reading. Afterwards, she tended the animals again. It was a happy childhood, she recalled, in which there was plenty of time to skip, to play netball and to pitch marbles. These were different days in Union Island, when the big drum would go in late into the early hours of the morning, and when the moon, or if you had one, a gas lamp, would be your only light in the dark because there was no electricity. Norma would remark, we didn't have no electricity, place dark like pitch, anybody could meet you and slap you in those days. <laughs> she made steady progress in school, graduating from Ashton Government School at 16. She then spent a year and a half as a sewing apprentice. It is worth just looking a bit deeper into Norma's family background. She occupied a special place on both sides of her family. On the side of her mother, Edna, or Aunt Edna, as we called her, she was the only daughter of eight children, eight boys, which includes her surviving brothers, Lionel, Harold, and Cyril, as well as her beloved late brother, George Howard. She made regular visits to St. Vincent to see them, and remembered also spending time with her grandmother, Eva, who reached more than 100 years old. On her father's side, Norma was the first grandchild of Jonas and Adelaide Ferrari, who had both come to Union from Canawan and were conversant in the Patois, the French Creole language, which combines various African languages and French. They were consistent churchgoers, and Adelaide in particular was known for her cooking and her generosity, which earned her the nickname Mother Noble. She was a key influence on Norma's life. Norma remembered visiting Adelaide's mother, her great-grandmother, the long-haired Mama Charlotte Garraway in Canawan. We also know that Jonas's grandmother, Tante Ruth's great-grandmother, Isabella, was a slave who worked on the Carinage estate in Canawan before moving to Myra, where she married a Costa Rican man called Phileas Ferrari. Why is this historical background important? I think the time spent traveling up and down the islands Visiting family members, many of them elders, would have left a lasting impression. Norma, Norma grew up at a time when slavery was still within living memory and when the languages of the slaves, the patois, were still spoken. She was a step closer to the meaning and the significance behind the proverbs and the stories, the ancient wisdom we retain from Africa, the, rem, rem, the remnants of which we express through the big drum. When you spoke to her, you heard a sort of lyricism, a rhythm, a vocabulary, and a way of telling stories which was really quite unique. This institution, St. Matthias Church, has been an integral part of my grandmother's life for over 90 years. It was at this church in Sunday school that Norma met a tall young man from Campbell called William Thomas. It was also here that they married on the 7th of January, 1948. That year was important for other reasons too. Their first daughter, Anastasia, was born that October, and the first brick was laid on their home down in Camberwood. It was around this time that the young family moved to Aruba, where William found work on the ships. Two more children followed, Tyler and then Yvette. She had fond, she had fond memories of her time in Aruba, even though few people spoke English on the island. She did manage to learn a bit of Papiamento, the language there in Aruba, including the phrase, cabeza male, your head ain't good. <laughs> the family returned to Union in 1953 to live in the Campbell home, which started as a one room up and a one room down house. Over the years, it began to expand until it became a famous haven guest house as well as a home. Other children followed. 
Chesney, Kay, Benita, who is deceased, and Bernadine. Over the years, the house became a lively place with Granny raising other children too. Her second daughter, Yvette, my mother, was away, growing up with relatives in Trinidad. Shipping children off, as was the habit in those days, could be the source of dysfunctional relationships. Not so with Granny Norma, who made sure her daughter visited regularly, who sent clothes, tamarind ball, and chilabibi. Sometimes it's small things that count. She called regularly, and when Yvette moved to England, and after I was born, Norma came to London to make sure that we were incorporated into the family. Her husband, William Thomas, moved to England in 1959, but she decided to stay in Union Island to be with the children. We could only imagine the challenges she faced bringing up those six children there on her own. Yet, she still had the patience and the love to bring up the children of other people as well. When I asked her how she coped, she said that the children slept well at night and they didn't give her any problems and that they were very obedient. Then came another generation, grandchildren. Masani, Jacinta, was followed by Bobby, then Violin, and then Ken and Kerry, all of whom who grew up in the house in Cameroon. Granny was able to cultivate a very personal relationship with each and every one of us, so much so that over the years, a fierce competition has emerged over which one of us is her favorite. <laughs> Kerry is convinced it's in. Nigel thinks it's in. Cozy and I refuse to back down. And perhaps Dwight also is in the rush out too. Granny did much to fuel this contest herself, because during those precious moments we spent with her, out on the top step, or on the balcony, as she put her feet up while, while shedding her peas or her corn, you felt like the most special person in the world. You came away convinced that you were her favorite. She would do everything to satisfy you. I remember one of the days when she used to keep behind a bottle of red juicy, just for me which would turn to me with those small, intense eyes, those kind eyes, and say, my son. While she showered her family, including her Ferrari and Howard nieces and nephews, with love and affection, she had plenty left in the tank for everyone else. She had friends from all walks of life, from the boys in the block, to her sisters in the church choir, where she served for over 50 years. You left the house well-fed, encouraged, and always entertained. She was a funny woman who could turn a phrase with a similar ease to how she turned her hand in the kitchen. And food was very important, very, very important. Sticking to a menu she learned from her grandmother with pea soup Tuesdays and wangu pua and fish Fridays being particularly memorable, she was able to create a sense of community. Grandchildren and great-grandchildren could come and get their lunch, get to know one another and get to know her. Miraculously, even if you brought a friend, and many did, there was always enough to go around. Even teachers at the Union Island Secondary School were known to stop by for a bite as well. One of the enduring memories I have of Granny are the sounds of humming and singing hymns as she went about her business. I think that hymns were an important way for her to connect with her creator, or as she put it, to rejoice with the Lord. And as she lay there surrounded by friends and family in those final days, she again turned to song. Ultimately, I think that she was a profoundly spiritual woman. She was more than just a churchgoer, a Bible reader, or a singer of hymns. She applied those lessons she learned to her own life. And she was deeply influenced by those who came before her, particularly her grandmother, Adelaide Ferrari, whose grave lies just beside where she will be buried in a few hours' time. She said it to me once, even though something is not right and somebody says something that is wrong or does something that is wrong, I don't like to rough people up. You sit down and we thrash it out. My grandmother taught me that, she said. If there's anything wrong, you throw water on it and you go forward. When I think of Granny, I think of an abounding love and generosity, I think of sincerity and I think of sacrifice. Who will be the next Granny Norma? I ask this question because communities revolve around such figures. If everyone is thinking about themselves, about their own families, about getting ahead, then what hope do we have? I would like to take the time to say that while Granny has gone, this is a message to, to our family. We must do everything in our power to hold the fort, as she said. That was an important part of her mission, to keep us close, to keep us together. 
I'd like to thank Father Weeks and the congregation of the United, United, Union Island Anglican Church for their continued support. To Keith Howard for his organize, organizational skills in ensuring that our relatives and friends were able to attend today. I give a special thanks to my aunties who have woken up very early, slept very late, um, to, to do so much, the wake, the funeral, and everything. And a special thank you, of course, to the doctors and nurses at the Union Island Health Centre who went beyond the call of duty. I would just like to finish on this last quote from my grandmother. She said, when I was in St. Vincent, the doctor came to me and asked me to rub his head because I'm a 90 and a 5. <laughs> and he asked me, what is my menu for a long life? I said, number one, peace of mind. Number two, eat and drink early. Number three, live for the Lord and continue to rejoice with the Lord. Thank you very much.
and we pray that having opened to heart the gates of large life, you will receive a more and more into your joyful service that with all who have served you in the past, we may share in the eternal victory of Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never can to any end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, said my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. But the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul, of, to the soul that seek him. It is good that one should wait quietly. For the Lord it will not reject forever. Though he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict nor grieve anyone. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Now, Psalm 23 to the song. Psalm 23 to the song.
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 2 to 26. Through which also you are being saved, if you firmly hold to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to someone untimely born, born sorry, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so we have come to believe. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. For we are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testify of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead also come through a human being. For all has died in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruit, then is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Here in Amen. Amen.
stand in for the gospel. The Lord be with you. A reading from the 14th chapter of St. John's Gospel, beginning at the first verse. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. St. Paul 
urges us to rejoice in our sufferings. The natural reaction of the unspiritual person, the person who do not have a close relationship with God, would be to recoil from these words in horror. Why? In an age of technological advancement and medical science, which have brought great measure of comfort in suffering, where legal drugs are available by prescription and over the counter to treat every ailment, any thought of enduring suffering has a dreadful ringtone for the 21st century patient or sick person. But for the apostle, retreating from suffering should not be the Christian response. But embracing suffering because of spiritual benefits it has for the believer. Suffering can be used as an important ministry in witnessing to the love and the goodness of God. The last time I saw Norma in Ashton's hospital, she wanted to do one thing. She wanted to hold my hand. And she held it tightly. And without words being exchanged, a message, significant message, was transmitted to me. Not only she cared, but also her concern or her focus at that juncture was not on herself, not on her suffering. She was ministering to me. And a lot of us must remember that although suffering could be painful, suffering can be used even up to the final moment to witness for the kingdom of God and God's goodness and love. <coughs> Sister, I her daughter, I to tell you, I couldn't get her with my hand. I took her to her one time and she grabbed it back. Like if she was my love. <laughs> but we have uh, an appointment. Tola, I'm coming back next week, Thursday. And I want to meet you here. She didn't give me the chance. She died the day before. But the point I want to make is this. She communicated a message to me, even though she wasn't saying anything, by touch. And touch is very powerful. Touch transmits messages unspeakable. Paul delighted in boasting of his sufferings for Christ Jesus' sake. In Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he wrote extensively about enduring physical, spiritual, and emotional suffering as a faithful servant of his Lord Jesus Christ. His suffering came from whippings, shipwrecks, robberies, disloyalties, physical deprivation. I quote, I've endured far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless floggings, and often near death. Five times I've received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. For a night and a day, I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles who were strangers. 
danger. <laughs> danger in the city. Danger in the wilderness. Danger at sea. Danger from false brothers and sisters. In toil and hardship. Through many a sleepless night. Hunger and thirsty. Often without food. Cold and naked. And besides other things. I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for the churches. I believe Norma, like St. Paul, would have suffered from the hands of her own people. She would have suffered from false friends. She would have suffered from tongue whipping. And I said that because she fired straight from the hip. And I heard that coming out here today. Norma did not mince her words when it came to giving advice and telling the truth. Norma was not like some people today who believe in this new term and this new frame, political correctness. Said things in a nice way so you do not offend people. And people today get easily offended when you tell them the truth. She was very candid. And I believe people have thrown words that are in front and behind her back. But also, like St. Paul, who said he was daily under pressure because of his concern for the churches. Norma would have experienced criticism contending for her faith. And we have been told this afternoon by St. Paul that painful experiences in life are inevitable. From St. Paul's painful experiences, he derives several progressive spiritual benefits which he shares with us. These benefits are, first, suffering produces endurance. Suffering produces endurance. Suffering has spiritual value in that it produces unwavering persistence. Endurance is necessary when undergoing pain and suffering in resisting external pressure rather than hopelessly giving in to pressure. Our Lord Jesus endured pain and suffering on the cross and he triumphantly overcame pain and suffering and we hear this in some of his final words on the cross. It is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Hearing lies one distinct blessing of the Christian faith. The believer, according to St. Paul, is expected to rejoice and glory in suffering rather than complain, rather than incessantly mourn and groan, submitting to suffering as a necessary, inescapable evil. Secondly, suffering produces character. Character is that distinct quality which distinguishes one person from others. Endurance value is that it develops character. Job understood character's worth, declaring in the midst of his trouble, but God knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come out like gold. Endurance is suffering in the furnace where we are refined. 
The Greek word rendered character means tested value. The newborn child of God, that is the convert. And those who believe are precious in God's sight. But the tested and proven say, the one who experiences martyrdom means more to him because such person is a living testimonial of the character developing power of the gospel. <coughs> David wrote in Psalm 116 verse 17, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. When we stand before God on the day of reckoning, after material possessions, the new gods of the day, would have been stripped away and left behind. What we have gained by way of spiritual advancement will be retained. Progress or maturity in faith is what will amount to a decent testimony to God and place in glory. Thirdly, character produces hope. Hope is one of the three elements of the Christian faith joined by faith and love. No one hopes for what he or she already sees. Hope gives promise of sharing in the magnificence of God. When we, as St. Paul would say, would no longer see him face to face, we would no longer see him, sorry, through a glass dimly, but face to face. What we see now of Christ is as a poor reflection in a mirror. Suffering, greatest benefit is hope. Hope does not disappoint us because as St. Paul says in the text, God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The hope of God is not a pious wish. God's hope he offers us does not make a person ashamed. It does not disappoint because it is coupled with God's love. Human love at times brings disappointment and frustration, whereas the love of God brings joy and satisfaction. The Holy Spirit produces in believers an immediate and overflowing consciousness that he or she is the object of God's redeeming love. This love guarantees hope, a hope that will not disappoint. Paul encourages Christians he encourages you and me to embrace and endure pain and suffering when they come. St. Peter, in his epistle, categorizes sufferings Christians should not expose themselves to. He says, let none of you, none of you, suffer as a murderer, suffer as a thief, Suffer as a criminal. Suffer as a mischief maker. Let me repeat that. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, a criminal, or even as a mischief maker. Yet, if any of you suffers as a Christian, do not consider it a disgrace, but glorify God because you bear his name. 
Christians ought not to wallow in affliction, which can overwhelm. But in all things, give thanks. Receive great gain, well pleasing to God, who permits sufferings to expose the mental and character of his saints. Norma, for me, was a woman of exemplary character, an exemplary member of this faith community, a woman who worshiped faithfully on a weekly and regular basis. I heard her grandson say something very important, that not only did she read God's word, but what she heard, she applied it to our lives, to her life, sorry. Which means when we hear God's word, we must do the same. But a lot of us remain at the knowledge stage. We do not go to the stage of application. Simply, if God said, don't lie, you try not to lie. I said, try it. <laughs> if God wants to don't steal, then you don't steal. And in a lot of our communities, there's a lot of mischief making. Peter said it, not me. So those of you who are mischief makers, stop today. And we're going to have a much happier and healthier Union Island Amen. and the various communities Amen. in which we live. Norma was not like that. She was a peacemaker. She was for me like a cowgirl. She shot straight from the hip. But without malice, without intent to hurt or to harm. She sang in the choir with a heart full of gratitude. She was a member of the Aqua Group, a group that is established for community involvement. Last night I listened and I heard about all this uh, Tuesday pea soup and so on, feeding the community indirect, if you want to call it, community involvement. Girl, why don't you come back for one Tuesday? <laughs> <laughs> she had a band of us heart. And those of you who know about Barnabas, Barnabas had a large heart. When Barnabas and the Acts of the Apostles suddenly meet in the church and in the community, he had a piece of land. I don't know how many acres. But he sold it and he brought the money and laid it at the feet of the Apostles so that the Apostles could take care of the needy in the community. She had a large heart. She loved children. That is the touch I overheard. She loved the children. And as I mentioned earlier, I hope and pray that we return to a society where we be honest and upfront with each other. St. Paul said, don't lie, don't try and put away the brother or sister. But tell them the truth. Not to denigrate, not to hurt them but tell them the truth in love. When I heard Norma's very forthright, she reminds me of, um, I think it's Paris and a character from here as well. When Norma talked, the same as if no doubt that. She was, for me, the example of the same to the general community. When what was expected of her, the humility of spirit, gently living above the fray. A 
Sterling Quality Lama has left loved ones and friends to her ordeal, patience in suffering without complaining. She's asking you, and she has set the example, to use your suffering to come out of yourself and reach out to others. Norma's last days, she suffered with dignity. Like St. Paul, Norma fleshed out for us. Suffering does produce endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Norma knew full well what she hoped for will be granted. And she will not be disappointed when the time comes to see her God face to face in his eternal glory. On behalf of St. Matthias Church family, Father Frank Garraway, family member who really wanted to be here. He called this morning to say he couldn't make it. He has the flu, he could not travel. On behalf of my wife Judy and I, who visited on our last visit to Norma, spent long time with her. Our sincere, serious condolences to you for bereaved children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, other relatives. And I want to make special mention here of Andrew, very dear to my heart, who was expecting that Norma would have been with her. April 18th coming to celebrate the 100th birthday. <coughs> Our deepest condolences. Almighty God promised 75 years. This is what the psalmist said. 80 if we are strong. Listen to the progression. 70 years. 80 if we are strong. Do you remember they had a candy? Well, I don't even know if call it a candy, but we used to suck it as young boys. We used to call it extra strong. Y'all yeah. remember extra strong candy? Yeah. Put up your hand, let me see. Yeah. So if 70, God promises. Eight if we are strong, then for me, Norma is extra strong. <laughs> she lived 95 years as a stalwart witness and contender for her Christian <laughs> Relatives and friends grieve not as men and women without hope. Instead, thank God for her long life. <laughs> Remembering the words of David, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Amen.
this um, what I will call social gathering party last night <laughs> in the wake for now. Nigel before Jesus was crucified, he celebrated his last supper, whatever they call his last party with his friends. The Eucharist, and I want to I use language people understand, is the church's last party for normal moment for and family members. Page 126. To your goodness, Lord, we have this bread and wine to offer, the fruit of the earth and the work of human hand. They will become our spiritual food. for the commemoration of the dead and we will use the uh, form D. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right that the good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give you thanks. Father Almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who rose victorious from the dead and comforts us with the blessed hope of life eternal. For to your faithful people, O Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when our mortal body lies in death, there is prepared for us a dwelling place eternal in the heavens. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this thing to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy,
that we suffer, he took a cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me.
Give rest to Christ, 
to your servant with your saints. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind. And we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For sinning you ordained when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust. The heat that is great, we make our song. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the sin of the earth. Let us commend our sister Norma to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. Deliver your servant Norma, O sovereign Lord Christ, from all evil and set her free from every bond, that she may rest with all your saints in the eternal habitation, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God forever and ever. Amen. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Norm. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, the blessed rest of everlasting peace and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen.
uncertain hope of resurrection to eternal life to our Lord Jesus Christ we commend to Almighty God our sister Norma and we commit our body to the ground earth to earth ashes to ashes dust to dust and we beseech you in your infinite goodness to give us grace to live in your dear love and to die in your favor that when your well-beloved son shall come again in judgment 
both this our sister Norma and we ourselves may be found acceptable in your sight. Grant this for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom still live the spirits of those who die in the Lord, with whom the souls of the faithful are in joy and solicity. We give you heartfelt thanks for the good examples of all your servants who have been finished their course in faith. They all find rest and refreshment. May we with all who have died in the true faith of your holy name have perfect fulfillment and bliss in your eternal and everlasting glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Grant to Lord, to all who are bereaved, the spirit of faith and courage, that they may have strength to meet the days to come with steadfastness and patience, not sorrowing as those without hope, but in thankful remembrance of your great goodness and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Rest eternal grant unto Norma, O Lord. May she and all the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. The Lord bless her and keep her. The Lord make his face to shine upon her and be gracious to her. The Lord lift up his countenance upon her and give her peace. Amen. Graveside okay. hymns, please.
No. <laughs>